All right. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Today I have the distinct privilege to introduce the first female Army Reserve soldier to successfully negotiate the challenges of Army Ranger School. A businesswoman, author, inspirational speaker, CrossFit enthusiast, mother and wife, Lieutenant Colonel Lisa Jaster is here to share her message of work-life integration. Without further delay, please give a warm Warriors Corner welcome to our friend and family member, Lieutenant Colonel Lisa Jaster. Thanks, Simon. Okay, so I'm gonna start this off a little different and I'm gonna say I wanna have a discussion. Is anybody okay with that instead of me just talking at you? Work-life balance. <laughs> Work-life balance is a very interesting topic. And one of my favorite things about talking about this is it's a farce. Anyone knows that there is no such thing as work and life. It is a continuum. Earlier this morning, Sergeant Major Lombardo actually quoted Lieutenant General Daniels saying it's not work-life balance, it's work-life integration. I'll take it one step further. It's work-life support. So interesting thing happened to me literally on the way here. One of my favorite guilty pleasures is buying a dark chocolate candy bar, some Coke Zero, and a Harvard Business Review. And I do it every time I go to the airport. I know, I know, I need better pleasures. <laughs> but Harvard Business Review, right? So, and of course, even though I'm an engineer, I fight my urges to be too linear. So instead of reading the magazine from front to back, I just open in the middle. And it happened to pop open to an article about DE&I. And something it stated really hit me. It said, we need to stop talking about diversity and inclusion. What we need to start talking about is work-life support. And then those people who we normally can't bring into the fold will start being more available. So we look at crowds of people, we look at groups of people, and we're like, how can we get more women involved? How can we get more of this minority group involved? Well, what's keeping them uninvolved? And for some of us, it's I don't have the time. And since I'm an Army Reservist, I've got to focus on that. So why am I up here? My story is one that many people have heard, apparently. Um, as Simon mentioned, I happened to go to Ranger School in 2015. At 37 years old, I actually finished it. Uh, only one shoulder surgery afterwards, so that's pretty good. Um, but that's just six months. It should have been nine weeks, but that's just six months of my story. My life includes, I am the proprietor of two LLCs. Tommy Goff, I use that to manage my rental properties, and they are all self-managed. Delete the adjective, I use for my keynote speeches, executive coaching, and now my book that's coming out in January. Not a shameless plug there at all. Um, and then I'm also the par a partner in a talent management leadership organization. So that's my day job. What's more important is I also have a really, really, really severe desire to serve. And someone told me when I joined the reserve, um, it's one week in a month, two weeks a year, and I thought I could fit that in. Um, I just left battalion command, and if anybody thinks the Army Reserve is one week in a month, two weeks out of the year, welcome to our life. <laughs> oh, on top of that, I have two kids that I really like, and I have a husband that I want to stay married to that I love. So I would take a pause there, but the reason why I'm talking about this is because it doesn't stop there for me. This Saturday, actually Friday, I have to make weigh-ins because on Saturday, I'm going to be competing in a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu competition. Three weeks from now, I will be competing in the tactical games. So that is my life in a nutshell. So that is why I'm here to talk about work-life support. I think the number one thing we have to do, and I have these great quotes, but I have them here, not here. Um, and the first one, I'm gonna say is, if you don't know what you want, you end up with a lot that you don't. Does that make sense? How many things 
do we put on our plates? Constantly loading ourselves up. I talked to a young officer who's in nursing school, who's trying to ju juggle school, still her military obligations, being a mom, and being a wife. Now, I know men go through this stuff too, so I'm sorry, I'm going to refer to moms, but you can replace dads if you need to, because I do understand you all love your kids as much as, as we do. So she's juggling all this, and she went on this little support group we have on Facebook for women trying to do well on the ACFT. And she was mad. She just barely passed her diagnostic ACFT. She was kicking herself. She was really ticked off. And I replied. And trust me, my goal is a 600 every time. I won't lie. But I was the first one to reply. And you know what I said to her? I'm like, did you succeed? Yes. Did you meet the standard? Yes. Do you want to do better? Yes. All great. How's the rest of your life going? Because sometimes, if we put too many things on our plate, 600 on the ACFT, honor graduate from nursing school, and actually a supportive wife and mother, it's too much. So what do you really care about right now? That's the first thing I want to say about work-life support. Nobody can support you if you don't know what your priorities are. So I'm going to take another quote. And I'm actually going to go through these quotes fast because, like I said, I do want to have a discussion. And enough people are making eye contact that I think we can make this work. OK, the next quote is going to be, wisdom is knowing what you want and what you need. Here's the kicker. Happiness is knowing what you have to keep and what you have to let go. Ladies and gentlemen, let go. Just, just Lisa Jaster as a soldier. I have physical fitness requirements. I have tactical and technical skills. And let's be honest, as a lieutenant colonel who hopes to be higher rank someday, I have the desire, the need to come to things like this and talk to people. Like, there's a lot that goes into just this uniform. And as I started out, I wear seven or eight hats. So if seven or eight hats each have three or four buckets, nobody has time for that. We all only get issued 24 hours in the day. So let things go. So Cheryl Sandberg, I had the pleasure of meeting her a couple years ago. And if you don't know who she is, she's the former COO of Facebook. And if you don't know who she is, please look her up. She's really impressive. Um, and I actually get, got to have dinner at her house. And when you have an opportunity to sit across the table from somebody who's that successful, who's been on the cover of that many magazines, you choose your words wisely. So I asked her one very simple question. Ma'am, how the hell do you do it all? Yeah, that's as, that's as deep as I got. How the hell do you do it all? Her kids love her. Um, her husband had died in a horrible, like, in a shocking incident, like medically, just, just died one day on the beach. So she's one of the most highly acclaimed working women in the world with two kids. She said, you let the stupid stuff go. She goes, when I drop my kids off at school, they don't even look at me. So somebody else drops them off. It wasn't value added time. So if she went to work early and someone else dropped her kids off at school, she got more work in, and then she got to spend time in the evenings with her children when they actually wanted to be around her. And I thought, oh, but you just said it's OK for me to not mother. No, prioritize. They don't care. And there's things you can drop off your to-do list, like my young nursing officer. Does she need to get a 500 on the ACFT to be a successful nursing officer? Man, I wish she could, but she doesn't have to. That's not the priority. So it's OK to let some balls drop. I'm saying that. I want everybody to hear it, because most of the people in here are senior even to me. It is OK to let some balls drop. You've got rubber balls and you've got glass balls. Hold those glass balls up. Protect them. That's my, hey, when I take this uniform off, I want my husband to still be there. That is precious. That is precious. I want my kids to not be mad at me. That's never going to happen. So we can just let that one drop. 
I want to hit you guys up with a, a third quote. Um, and this one's my favorite. And so this is where we're going to go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start this discussion. And at this point in time, if anybody has any questions, comments, or things they want to discuss, go ahead and bring it up. If not, you're going to hear a lot of stories about my kids. If I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Oh, we love that quote in the military, don't we? We do. I'm going to put a new spin on it. Completely different. Those giants are your team members. That's your kids. That's your family. And if you don't have kids and family, that's your best friend. Could be your dog. I don't care. It's the people living, the living things around you that support you in what you do. So the first thing I said is figure out what you want. If you want good work-life integration, ma'am, or in my case, work-life support, figure out what you want and let people know. The second thing is go ahead and drop those balls. Figure out what's not important and let it go. And third, build your team. This one's the most important to me. We're a dual military family. We're joint at home. I didn't get the joint badge for that, but I tried. Um, I actually, I think I need an award for living with a Marine. <laughs> Love my husband to death, but by having a joint home, I can say, hey, baby, I'm going to leave the house at 3 o'clock in the morning and go to AS AUSA for three days, and I'll be back when I get back. The kid's schedule is on the refrigerator. His exact response, roger that. Leave Lisa at home, let Lieutenant Colonel Jaster go. Easy, because I built a team of support. But not everybody has that. But you need to figure out what that support looks like. And it starts at home. And again, it doesn't have to be in your domicile, but do you have a best friend that understands? I'm not talking about the guy you call and he fixes stuff for you. We all have that friend, right? Hey, I had a bad day. Oh, well, let me tell you how to fix it. I'm talking about the one who, hey, I had a bad day. Hey, let me grab a case of beer or water or sparkling substance, and I will come over to your house and let's work through it. I'm talking about that team. Building a team and building a tribe, it's what we have in the military, but it's different than it used to be because work-life balance wasn't a thing. Lieutenant Peplinski used to say stuff like, if the Army wanted you to have a wife, it would have issued you one. And I believed it. And I think our leadership at that time did as well. So for those of us who have been in uniform for more than a minute, especially if you were active duty around September 11th, that really was the way we felt. And that's how we treated our soldiers. That's not the soldiers we have anymore. So we need to build our team in uniform. But even more important, we need to build that tribe out of uniform. I'm going to use a slightly different example when talking about building a team. I work with a Navy SEAL, and yes, he's written at least one book. His second's coming out. <sighs> but he is part of my tribe, and, and this is a weird thing. So in my day job, I, I talk to people very similar to this. Um, I wear more comfortable clothing. And when I talk to people, they need to hear certain messages. But my Navy SEAL buddy, his name's Mike Sorelli, he's awesome, but he is all in the oorah, shaved head, kill him, kill him, go, you know? Pretty impressive, impressive guy. Well, sometimes the audience doesn't need to hear from somebody who's hardcore. Sometimes the audience needs to hear a message from somebody who's a little less hardcore. So I can lean on Mr. Sorelli and say, hey, boss, what do you think this group really needs to hear and how they need to hear it? And he can give me the tools I need to help the people I'm trying to work with. That's a team. That's a tribe. That's a commander sergeant major relationship. That's a commander first sergeant relationship. That's a platoon leader platoon sergeant relationship. That's a spousal relationship. Sometimes it's your kid. Hey, Zach, Tori's messing up. How do I deal with this? Sh those kids are part of my team. They're helping me 
talk to the other and build that relationship. So again, talking about work-life balance and talking about that integration, there has to be a solid team. Now I wanna, I wanna loop back into the integration discussion, into the balance discussion, because I started off saying there is no such thing as work-life balance. Does anybody ever stop caring about your family when you're at work? And really, if you do this, how, how many part-timers do I have? And that's my affectionate term of reserve National Guard. Okay. Do you ever really, I mean, the fact that you still wear the uniform means you're passionate about this uniform. Because I don't know about you, but I, I, don't, I don't know that I get paid quite enough for the amount the Army asks me to do. I do this because I love it. Which means I'm never with my family and forget that I'm also a service member. Work life is completely melded. I make decisions based on that. I don't see any hands raising, so I'm guessing nobody has any questions. So you get to hear family stories, all right? Perfect. So I have the several buckets as a reservist. Tools and techniques to make sure I can cover down on those. Every Saturday, and most Saturdays, I have a bro sesh with my kids. How many people know what a bro sesh is? Where's my meatheads? Come on, I know there's at least one. You're giggling, so I'm guessing. I'm making assumptions about you. Okay, bro sesh is where you lift until you're practically crippled. It's fun. You do 12 pull-ups, then your 14-year-old does 13 pull-ups, and then you go back up there and do three pull-ups and cry about how you tore a blister on your hand. Um, but, you know, you, you try. So we have these bro sessions, and it's really fun. My kids are excellent at the ball toss because I am terrible at the ACFT ball toss. So what do we do? We've got 8 pound, 10 pound, 14 pound, 20 pound, 50 pound, 80 pound, and 100 pound balls at my house. And we start with the 8 pound and throw it, 10 pound, and then and I put it on Instagram to make sure that the proof exists. My son and I did the 100 pound ball. It might have slid right down my back, but it did go over my shoulder. So I'm just saying, it is possible. But that's one of the ways where I do all three of the quotes I just mentioned. What's important to me? Family. Fitness is important to me. I'll be really honest. You can't go to ranger school and be one of the first to do something and gain five pounds and not have a bunch of people notice. So I will have to, until I die, make sure that I'm 140 to 145 pounds. Just life. So I got my family time in. I got my fitness time in. But I got something more. I've got empathy from my kids. My team understands my goals a little bit more. And so you know what happened? My son one day, knowing that I didn't want to work out, knowing that I didn't want to do things, he, as part of my team, said, hey mom, let's go to the gym. And he literally grabbed the 10 pound ball. He said, I'll shank the balls for you. I tossed, he ran. It was fun. But I had to jump on the trampoline with him afterwards. That was our deal. Yes, ma'am. Oh, sorry. Do you ever find that you need me time? You know, downtime, alone time, quiet time, or how do you how do you find that for yourself? Yes, ma'am. I excellent question because it is where I sacrifice. I think a lot of us um, sacrifice our personal time, but I have started setting an alarm. My husband hates this, <laughs> but luckily he's not here to yell at me. I set my alarm 10 minutes before I have to get up and hit snooze, but I don't hit snooze to go back to sleep. I hit snooze, and it's a 10-minute snooze, so that I spend 10 minutes every morning going through not really yoga or relaxation techniques. I think about what's going on in the day. Engineer, I make my mental lists. What do I have to do today? But it's also that one time 
where nobody needs to be fed, nothing needs to be cleaned, nothing else needs to happen. I lay quietly in bed for 10 minutes and focus just on me. And I wish it was longer, but ma'am, I do. I, every day I have my 10 minute snooze. Now my husband thinks I'm snoozing. I'd say I'm reflecting. And I think that's part of a good leader too, is you have to be okay yourself. And, and that, that goes back to that first quote, like what are your personal priorities? You have to focus on yourself and as leaders, especially as senior leaders, like many of the people in this area are, it is so easy to give and give and give and to forget that you can't give if you've got nothing left in your own, in your own uh, reserve. Do we have any other comments or questions? Yes, sir. So having worked with Alan in California, <laughs> could you speak to how the two of you work-life balance your two dual pursuits? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So um, Alan is my husband. He's my much better but much bigger half. Um, I married a um, large Marine, and I say that because he's six foot nine. Don't give me eyeballs. He, I'm not calling him fat, I promise. Um, he is, he's six foot nine, um, and he is Marine. He's a civil affairs guy. He was Marine Recon, um, and I tried, actually. I got off active duty because, and um, stayed off active duty for five years so that we weren't in commands together. We both had active duty company commands at the exact same time. Oh, that was a romantic period in my life, I'm telling you. Um, and then we ended up, he went into battalion command, so I was going to have a nice, easy break, my five-year break in service. Instead, I went to ranger school while he was in battalion command. Awesome. Uh, then he took 06 command one month before I took 05 command. So to, ta to say that we have completely failed in decoupling our careers uh, would be a gross understatement. But what we do is we've tried to build that team. So we don't have family that lives next to us. We don't, have, we don't have the support group, very similar to when we were on active duty. There's nobody there to take up the slack uh, when we can't. So we have gotten to the point where, hey, I'm gonna take an IMA position this year if you can take this. Now, command billets, as you're well aware of, sir, we can't decouple those, but right now I'm in a role where I drill once a quarter for about a week. And so we can figure out how to support each other that way. The good thing is, when I say, hey, babe, I got to leave, he says, Roger, totally understand. But when I have this on my calendar and he supersets it with, or he uh, puts on his little duty on top of it, I say, hey, it's your job to find, find child support. Now, with that, our kids have made it super easy because they're part of our team. And, and we've worked really hard at this. Our kids are definitely part of the team. And with other people's children, you know, all y'all's children are amazing, but not every kid could handle the push off that we give them at times. Hey, baby, I, I love you. You're going to the ranch for a week, but, but Popo makes me cut wood. Okay, you're cutting wood for a week because that's life. And, and our kids are flexible enough that they're able to do that. But I very much appreciate that question, sir, because um, Alan is the only reason I can do what I do. And he is specifically the one who told me when I went to ranger school and I got in that cab, he shaved my head for me. And he sat there and was like, you're beautiful. My kids, my daughter cried, and my son told me that I was still pretty on the inside. So... A little different story there. They tried, they tried. But he, he also continues to say, hey, now I need Lisa, now I need mom, now I need wife, now I need Lieutenant Colonel Jaster. And he completely acknowledges that although all of those personalities reside in this body, sometimes one takes the lead over another. What other comments or questions do we have? Yes, ma'am, over here. So uh, my question is, how do you articulate your needs or your requirements, right? I think that you can voice them differently to the audience. So I think that's one that when I'm talking with some people that I might be mentoring, that's a different conversation, or your boss on the civilian side. I'm, I'm always saying, how do you say what is it that you need, and how do you convey that? 
That's not an easy question. Thank you. Thank you. She wants to see if I can tap dance. 12 years. I learned. So um, really good question. And communication is a huge problem and a huge asset. Uh, receiver and sender. I can tell you as much as I want to tell you, but if I'm not taking into account who's listening, I'm going to fail, and that message won't be heard. So when it comes to my needs, the first thing I do is figure out who the audience is. I'm using family as an example only because it's easy and safe, because my family will never watch this Facebook Live because they're not interested, um, and I don't want to offend anyone else. But when I'm talking to my employees, if I've got a 24-year-old young person who just graduated from college and I need to get them motivated to do what I need them to do, I can't talk to them like I do my business partners. So the four business partners I have are all veterans. Um, so it's very easy. Our, our meetings, our weekly meetings are a 15 minute and we call it all hands meeting. And it's, dude, do this. I need this from you. You're late on this. Hey, let's talk later. And there's no conversation. When you bring in those younger generations sometimes, or just more sensitive generations, or more sensitive individuals, you can't start with, hey, I need. You have to start with, hey, how are you today? What does your workload look like? Hey, listen, I'm really, really overwhelmed with this. And this is something I've used a lot when I have to step back because I've overfilled my plate. Hey, would you be OK dropping this and helping me with this. As a supervisor, I'm okay if this doesn't get done on time. This is one of those rubber balls that if it falls, it'll bounce back, we'll address it later. And that's a very complicated discussion. Where it gets even more complicated is when it comes into those emotional needs. When it comes into, I have a need with regards to my family. I think whether you're communicating up or communicating down, the number one thing I failed for my first 10 years of my professional career was I tried to leave my family at home. I didn't have a picture of my husband on my desk. My screensaver was something work-related. I worked oil and gas, so I'm telling you, that was exciting. It actually was pipes. Awesome. And then it was the young guys at Ranger School, of all the people in the world, those 20-somethings, who taught me to bring all of me. Because that's how you connect with people. And you can't communicate without connection. You can't communicate in the corporate world, and you definitely can't commu communicate in the military world without connection. And I love taking that connection and communication and tying it into leadership. I went through. I just finished a Civil War series. Like, I, all the books I read, the audio books I was listening to, they were all Civil War. I don't know why, it just kind of happened that way. Well, about three years ago, I went through all World War II, and I was on a huge Patton kick. And man, Patton, I quote Patton, Patton's in my signature block, I love Patton. Okay, well, Patton would not make it very far in today's army. Love him to death, but you cannot tell a young group of soldiers, take that hill and just have them do it. Not to be ser too uh, serious, but let's talk COVID shots. Like, how would Patton have dealt with COVID shots, right? It's a different army. It's a different world right now, right? So we have to connect and be able to look at someone and say, hey, listen, I know this is what you're going through, but I need you to take that hill. I don't care about your COVID shot status. I need you to take that hill. And that individual connection is very, very important today more than ever before. And it goes back to that idea that we can lead three to five, depending on what book you read, right? You can lead three to five. We need to stop trying to lead 1,300. We need to remember we lead three to five. We care about all 1,300. That was, my battalion was just under 1,300 people. I couldn't possibly know the ins and outs of all those people. I could care about them, but I could lead those eight company commanders. Ma'am, did you have a comment? Um, I'm com or, ugh, sorry. I am currently an AGR uh, public affairs officer at a battalion. Um, as a TPU commander, the thing that I've always noticed is the AGR force just always feels stretched and stressed. Um, as an AGR currently, I'm in a, a unique role where I'm the senior AGR. I can control 
um, a little bit more of the scheduling and make sure that they have a good work-life balance. But for those AGR soldiers who are not in an environment like that, do you have any recommendations for them? Yes. No, but yes. It's, it's a great topic because, again, I, I dealt with this quite a bit recently. So we abuse the living daylights out of AGRs. How many other AGRs do we have here? Do we have any others? Yeah. Whew. Thank God for you guys. Um, I abused mine. Um, hopefully I didn't abuse them so bad that they hate me, but I definitely abused mine. But I think one of the... Does everybody understand what a, the AGR soldiers are doing for people who aren't... You got your AGRs, which are full-time, and then you got TPUs like me that, are, that think we can pop in one week in a month, two weeks out of year. And we pop in and we're like, hey, I'm in charge. I'm going to make all the decisions. But I, I may or may not have communicated throughout the whole month. And, and that becomes complicated for the full-time soldiers, but it's also complicated for those of us who are trying to do it part-time because the Army doesn't pay my mortgage. So if there's a meeting on Thursday and, or I get paid for the work requirements that are going to pay my mortgage, I might have to miss that Army meeting. So communication is, is right there as well. But I think for the AGR soldiers who are doing the heavy lifting, I would love to say that all of us in uniform are highly motivated, dedicated, and we are. We are. We wouldn't stay in the uniform if we weren't. But some days, and that was the Sergeant Major's panel this morning, some years you've got to back off that Army stuff or you won't have a wife when you go home at the end of your 20-year career. Sometimes you have to back off that Army stuff or you won't have a job. Not that they'll fire you because you're military service, but your performance might drop. So sometimes you have to back off, which what my AGRs did, and I absolutely loved them, they said, hey, ma'am, I'm going to give you this. These are the decisions you need to make. They did a lot of the legwork that as a battalion commander I wanted to do. But want and can are two totally different things. And that goes back to that second quote. Knowing what you have to keep and what you have to let go. When can I lean on my AGRs and when can I not? And that's a really, really complicated discussion. But AGRs can lead that discussion. And if you do it right, you can do it in a really respectful manner. And, and like I said, I, I had a, my S3 was absolutely fantastic with, hey, ma'am, these are the exact things I need you to do. If you have extra time, these are the things I would like you to do. And um, it, is, it is complicated, and there's no easy solution. But if you can give, if you can dole out bitefuls to people who don't do it full time, it's very helpful. Yes, Ms. Sue Fulton. Ma'am. So you said, you, you said something that you learned uh, about bringing your whole self to work from those young, uh, those youngsters at Ranger School. I'm sorry, youngsters, right? Yes, uh, young soldiers at Ranger School. Um, so talk a little more about that. So you're a th 37-year-old mom, and, and you're, you're on a team with these 20-somethings. Can you give us an idea? <laughs> I'm not allowed to ask for my favorite story, am I? So give us an idea of how you built, how you built some of those connections uh, across what would look like a divide. You know, so, so let's start with the beginning of that. It's um, whole self. So there was a young gentleman in his foxhole. Now, for those of you who haven't had the pleasure of enjoying ranger school, the stats are you work about 20-hour days on average eating 22 to 2,400 calories per day on average, and you walk over 200 miles in a nine-week period of time, and your ruck weighs on average 80 pounds. So you're tired and hungry, and your feet hurt, basically. Um, and you get kind of broken down. And at what point in time, I'm going and checking on my soldiers in their fighting positions, and there was a young gentleman who was kind of I don't want to say crying, but he was kind of making some weird whimpery noises. And in his last letter from home, he had gotten an ultrasound. Oh, his wife's pregnant. There wasn't a single dude out there that cared. <laughs> Not right then. But I did, because it made me realize I had worked a lifetime with a bunch of dudes. I had been on an entire floor at Shell Oil Company, and I was the only woman using the female latrine. Or bathroom in this case. So I'd worked around a bunch of dudes and I've just, they didn't bring their whole selves to work. 
but he needed to. And I needed to recognize that while he's at ranger school worrying about whether he's carrying the 240 today or not, he's also worried about his wife. He's going to be a first-time dad. He doesn't know. All he knows is the horror stories about from his soldier brother and sisters of, my husband wasn't there for me when I was pregnant. My baby was born while I was in Iraq. Yes, I know you guys don't all talk like that, but, you know, fire for a fact, right? And I suddenly realized that he needed to bring his whole self. And it took him being so broken down, exhausted, and starving to share that with me. And then I thought, well, hell, we're all this way. And I actually changed my outlook on everything in that one moment. Because when I went back to Shell Oil, my, one of my business partners, one of my buddies, he was traveling all over the place because his wife stayed home with the kids. He had three kids, and the bosses thought it was completely okay to send him on the next project or on the next flight or the next whatever. He had no work-life balance. And I asked him one day, I'm like, do you want to travel? He goes, no, Lisa, I love my wife. I was like, damn, I can take the next trip. And I realized that, yeah, guys, you actually like your kids too. It was a super big realization for me. Ladies and gentlemen, I am at the end of this discussion. Um, I would love to talk more. This is something I could talk about for hours and days and weeks. Work-life balance, as the ma'am says, work-life integration, or as I say, work-life support is a critical topic, but it's not something I want to talk about just as an Army reservist. It's something that we need to talk about in corporate America. It's part of that DE&I discussion. It's part of opening our doors and opening our eyes. But the first step to a proper work-life integration is figuring out what you as the individual needs and communicate with those above, below, and next to you. And that includes your family and friends. Thank you very much for your time.